see everybody here today. Um, let's see, a few announcements. La Hacienda, you got an email about this. You should have if you are on the class roster. If you are not on the class roster, you did not get this email. So the way to get on the class roster is to make sure your name is on those red boxes, printed. And if it is not, then write your name and email address, and Connie will get you added forthwith. But it's going to be on Thursday, March 14th. It'll be the usual drill. Social, 6.30, dinner, 7, 30 bucks a person. Um, that includes your dinner, your tip, all of that, but it does not include your margaritas. So, um, and Don and Marion are going to collect money, cash only, all the usual, cash only, on February 18th, that's in two weeks, March 3rd and March 10th. So I just put that up there now. Um, there'll be plenty of space, it's a big place, so just so you know that's coming on, on Thursday, March 14th. There is no class on February 25th due to prom classes. This place is turned into like Nordstrom's, okay? <laughs> Tons of fitting rooms. I mean, it's really quite, quite, quite something, quite a project. So we are not able to have class on February 25th, which means what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the series we have now. Um, Dave Crawford is coming next week to next week. He's coming on the 18th to talk a little bit about um, Four Corners. So we're going to um, run this series um, through the 18th, and then on, we'll have a Sunday off, and then the first Sunday in March we'll begin the next series, which I have not decided on yet. So when I have decided, I will let you know. Um, okay, so there is a second event, second act event coming up on February 15th, again with Holly Stevens, who was here to talk about the history of Dallas in the, in the fall. She's great. You register online um, or call the church office. Megan Cook will be available to help you, but you should be able to register on, online. Um, and you'll see that it's in the weekly and monthly updates and things about, about second act. Do you have anything to add to that, Patty? No, that's great on that particular one. Okay. So the Met class missions collection will come around in a minute. Um, the red boxes are out there. Please, you know, register your presence. The prayer notebooks are out there. And if you have any that you would like lifted up at the end of class, please write those down as well. And Patty, how are you today? I'm great. How are you doing? Uh, well, I think I'm doing pretty well. All things considered. All huh? things considered. Yeah, yeah. Well, today isn't the most exciting of national days. It's National Hemp Day. National Hemp yes, Day. Yes, with an E in there. Okay. Um, it is Homemade Soup Day. Homemade Soup. And it's thank a mailman today, but obviously you couldn't do that till tomorrow, so... Thank a mailman day. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Is that really it? That's it. That's it, huh? That's it. Okay. Yeah. You well, know, you know how that goes. Yesterday, though, was a big day yes. for, you know, a lot of people maybe in our age group because it was the day the music died day. It oh, the, the big plane that, crash with the big, the big bopper and day. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay, yeah. that is a big day. That was a big day. It was the day the music died. I mean, that's... Right, the plane crash, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And American Pie, the song about it and yep. everything. You yeah, you got it. But um, that's about it for those kind of days. Um, you did have the slide up, and I, I don't have slides today, but there are a lot more um, second act events coming up, not just <laughs> in the learning, um, but in all different areas. So please check your email and um, Usually those emails come out on a Monday or a Tuesday. Monday come out like the all church events. Usually Tuesdays come out the second act thing. And it may not be, it may accidentally go to your junk file. So please be, you know, sure just to check them every couple days just to be sure that you didn't miss anything. Um, we did set two dates. Scott will be doing part two of his um, in the beginning was the word. The second part is, and the word became flesh, which he'll be doing 
uh, a two hour on the New Testament and um, that's not till April 4th. And then um, on March 7th, our wonderful Mona, who's over there, um, Mona and Carpenter, and um, I'm gonna be assisting her, but this, is, this was her kind of project and it was her foundation, the big foundation. And it does stand for Before I Go. But it is, it is not like the legacy book. This is where you will be given lots of tools and so much helpful information about how you write your own story, how you write your own story. So it, it's really great for somebody of any age. Um, sadly, most people wait till they're really sick and then take on a project like this. And because it's an e easy thing to just kind of, well, I can do that. Yes. Later. Yes. Right. But That's all you um, can. the amount of work Mona has put into this is amazing. She's got so many starter questions for you to even start think like where do I go with this and oh my gosh it's really going to be very very fun and it will not only be that one day we're going to commit to coming back like at least once a month to work on it for a few months till people kind of get going and um yeah because we, we don't want it to be something you start and then never add another thing exactly to it. so anyway we'll have more information on that soon and it will be in the newsletters Okay, anything else? That's it. That's it. All right, well, let's see. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be gathered here today, to have this opportunity to come together, to learn, to be in fellowship, um, and we pray, as we do every week, that your Holy Spirit, who has called us here, will fill us with lots of energy and enthusiasm as we continue to make our way through this series on women leaders in the early church um, impress this upon our minds and our hearts that indeed you have called all of us all of us to participate fully in your missio day your mission to reconcile humanity to yourself and to renew creation all this we pray in jesus's name amen, amen. Okay, my friends, so we are back in her story. Just to remind ourselves a little bit, this is, this is the territory of Paul's missionary work to carry the good news of Jesus Christ outward. This is basically the eastern end of the Roman Empire. Um, and last week we met a woman named Damaris who was in Athens when Paul arrived there. This story is told in Acts 17, and we talked about what a surprising thing it was that in this time with the Are at the Areopagus in Rome, in Athens, that Paul included the name of this woman. And like so many of these, I would just like to meet them, I'd like to find out what it is about them that um, drew Paul's attention and made them prominent enough, noteworthy enough um, to be recorded in this letter. I mean, just imagine you or I were recorded in some letter that people are still reading 2,000 years from now, just lifting us up as Damaris was, was lifted up. And we talked about Phoebe last week. This comes from Romans 16. Phoebe is one of the very noteworthy women in the New Testament. She is a deacon in the church at Sentry, which is just south of Corinth. Um, she is well known. She is, one, she is the one carrying this letter to Rome that Paul is writing, has written to the house churches in Rome. He himself has not been there yet, but he entrusts the letter to her, this deeply theological letter. You know as well as I do that when people heard this letter read to them, because most of the time it would be done orally, it would generate lots of questions. And who are those questions going to be taken to? Phoebe, she's coming from Paul. Paul commends her to the house churches in, in um, Rome. So she is much more than just a letter carrier. She is an integral part of Paul's ministry, and she would have been... Uh, better prepared than most, I suspect, to answer the questions that people have about the church, ab about the letter to the Romans. So would she have been teaching men in that context? 
Well, of course. She's coming from Paul. So, this is Prisca and Aquila. They are probably the most significant couple that you meet in the New Testament. And Prisca is one of the most significant people in the New Testament whose name a lot of people don't know. Now, her name, her given name is Prisca. You, you might know her as Priscilla, but Priscilla's like a diminutive, like Prisca Scott, Priscilla Scotty. So, so she is Prisca or Priscilla. Her name appears both ways in the New Testament. She appears in the book of Acts. She appears in the letter, first letter to Corinth. She appears in Ephesians. Um, her, she appears in Romans. But I want to take you to, and just read with you, we'll talk a little bit about um, her time with Paul in Corinth, okay? Now, this still is basically um, Prisca and Aquila as they were depicted in a movie which came out a few years ago called Paul the Apostle um, because they end up back in Rome, okay? Well, we'll talk about their travels in a minute, but they end up back in Rome. And in the movie, it's well depicted because they are partners, but there's nothing, there's, not, there's, no, there's no second seat, no second class seat for, for Prisca. She is in, as involved or more involved than her husband. There are times when she is listed first, Prisca and Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila, and that's very striking because in this time and age, that isn't how it works. The men were listed first. The husband was listed first. Scott and Patty. You wouldn't typically run into Patty and Scott, though you should have. So, um, but, so, so that right there, I mean, it, there are several reasons that could be. She could have all the money in the marriage. She could be a more prominent person, sort of secularly. But pro the easiest assumption is that she is the most prominent person among the two in the ministry that they are involved in because that's the context in which they're being referred to. So let me turn to um, Acts 18 and just, just read you just a little bit, tell you a little bit about their story, but as Luke tells it, okay? So Paul left Athens. That's where we were last week with Damaris, and I go southward to Corinth. And there he made a, met a Jew named Aquila, the husband, a native of Pontus, that is um, in Turkey, modern-day Turkey, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, the diminutive form of her name, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Well, we know enough about events of the day to figure that out. In 49 AD, the Roman Emperor Claudius, because of what Suetonius describes as a trouble around this name Crestus, C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S, around the name Crestus, Emperor Claudius orders all the Jews to leave Rome. Well, they want the peace kept, and there's trouble in the quarter, Jewish quarters, and they, they don't want to deal with it. So they order all the Jews out of Rome. Now, that one encompassed the Jews who did not embrace Jesus, certainly, but it seems to have encompassed also Jewish Christians, which tells us, not surprisingly, that the gospel had been brought to Rome at an earlier time. Okay? Um, like I said, the first week we started this, you, you, it's easy to come to this and think, think that, well, what we get in Acts is all that there is, but it's not all there is. We meet other people. It's clear that other things are happening. And here we have this husband and wife, Priscilla and Aquila, who have been basically ordered to leave Rome because all the Jews were ordered to leave Rome in 49 AD. So, they are in Corinth. Let me turn, I have, okay. Let me go back to my little map here. 
and get my other device, and I promise I'm not going to blind you, Patty. So, you see my green dot? Isn't that cool? There's Athens, and there's Corinth. In fact, you can see Sencre just south of Corinth. That's where Phoebe's from. Um, and there's Corinth. It's right on this really narrow, narrow strip of land, and, um, but a prominent city, an important place. It had always been because it's a very strategic location. Um, there was a way there that they used to try to cut off some of the sailing distance by dragging boats across the, the, the isthmus. Can't say it too well. Um, and uh, unloading them, dragging them, and then reloading them. So it was an important city. It was one that, that Rome had actually destroyed about 100 years before these events, but then, then decided that had been rash, and so they rebuilt it as a very Roman type of city. And so Paul has come down to Corinth, and it says here that Paul went to see them, Aquila and Priscilla, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. So tent maker, a worker in leather, a worker in canvas. Was it really all about tent building? Probably not. This is an urban location. They were probably doing a lot of building of awnings and other coverings to deal with the sun because the sun is very strong in this part of the world. But it's significant because Paul goes to see them and then he stays and he works alongside of them. There, is, there would have been in Corinth the marketplace, little shops. They might have shared a shop, um, but they are, um, let me go back to, um, they, would have, they would have shared a shop. Okay, there we go. This is a, some artist illustration of the three of them working in this tent making hey, canvas making, making awnings, whatever, all on the floor with their stuff. I've always assumed that the bald guy is Paul. I don't know why he made Paul bald. We don't know that for a fact. I'm guessing the artist was bald himself, um, <laughs> right? So, yeah, so he's working with them along. Now, this, let me just tell you, this is 18 months. Corinth is one of the longest stays that Paul has. The only one that's longer is Ephesus, where he actually is imprisoned for some of the time. But in Corinth, he's there a long time. This is not in town and out of town like some of the other places were. 18 months he spends in Corinth, getting to know people, preaching the word, working his trade alongside whom? Prisca and Aquila. Can you imagine working alongside Paul for 18 months? What do you think they talked about? What, yeah, the weather. <laughs> we all talk about the weather. Maybe donuts. <laughs> you know, Paul is there to preach the gospel. So Paul would, of course, do his usual routine. He would go to the synagogues and preach and not be received. Then he would go to the city square and and be still not greatly received. None of these places, no, I mean, there were never droves of people coming to, um, to Paul and agreeing with his message. Um, <clears throat> maybe four or five house churches in Corinth, um, someplace like, remember I brought these last week? Here's a wealthier person's house. That might be the sort of place Prisca and Aqua live in because by what we know about them and their traveling, the amount of it they do in um, the New Testament, it appears that they, they have some, some means. And this was that house in Pompeii that I brought last week just so you could see that center area where people would gather. But they are working alongside, alongside Paul Every Sabbath, Paul reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks, which is just how Luke puts it. Paul is doing his work. So he is supporting himself, which he was kind of proud of, that he would support himself as this tent maker working alongside Prisca and Aquila. 
and while he is out sharing the gospel, trying to convince people of the truth of the good news. So I'm going to skip down to verse 18. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. So um, to go back to the map, so they're going to go from Corinth across over to Ephesus. Right there. They're going to take make this trip, and they are going to go with Paul when he heads over to Ephesus at this stage of his journey. So obviously they are very, they are very close to Paul. A Jew named, this is verse 24 if you care, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. Now he was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. Alexandria was the second largest community of Jews in the Roman Empire. It is where the Septuagint was put together, this translation of the Hebrew scrolls into Greek about 150 years before Jesus. So Apollos is a learned man. He knows the Hebrew scriptures. He is from Alexandria, and he has now come to Ephesus. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, by whom we don't know. Somebody, like I said, there's folks out there doing things. And he spoke with great fervor, seems to have been a good orator, that's what that would mean, and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila, notice her name is first, heard him, they invited him to their home, like the picture I had earlier, probably a little bit larger home, I would think, and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Okay, so just picture for a minute. Priscilla and Aquila have worked along, they worked alongside Paul for 18 months. Then they sailed with Paul to Ephesus. This orator, learned in the scriptures, taught the way of the Lord, taught the good news, comes. But Priscilla and Aquila see in that something that they need to instruct him about. So they take him aside. And they teach him. What are they probably teaching him? We know that he, all he knows is the baptism of John. So I'll take this moment to explain what this is about. The baptism of John is the baptism in the Jordan River. It is a baptism of repentance. It is what the people are called to when you open the Gospels and you encounter John in the wilderness. He's gone to the Jordan River and he's baptizing people. What the word baptize simply means plunge. Baptizo in the Greek simply means plunge. So he's John the plunger, and he's plunging people, yeah, he's plunging people into the river. But it is a, it, it, it is a, a, it is a ritual of repentance. Come to the river, forsake your sins, re-embrace God, come out clean, hold on you go. That is not the baptism of Jesus Let me rephrase the preposition. That is not the baptism given to us by Jesus in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That baptism, which we practice, which all Christians practice, is a baptism into new life. Sure, repentance can be part of it, but that's, that's not really the main focus. The main focus of it is that we are reborn into this community of new life into this community of a new human race called by God to do God's work. Born again, born a second time. Paul says we were crucified with Christ. We've been risen with Christ. We are the ones on whom the ends of the ages have met and all these other phrases I talk about all of the time. That's what the baptism of Jesus, by Je the baptism in Jesus' name is all about. So it's not that the, he, it's not that Apollos is wrong. He knows the baptism by John the Baptist, but he doesn't understand 
the significance of the baptism given by Jesus. There's only two sacraments um, given by Jesus. They're called sacraments because they're given by Jesus, right? Um, and one is baptism and one is communion. So those are, the, those are the only two sacraments in the Methodist Church because they're the only two sacraments given by Jesus in, in Scripture. So just imagine, they t she's, they've taken this guy aside. What does that mean when you hear people tell you, some of your friends, and I know this happens because I talk to people to whom it has happened, when you have friends who try to tell you that women can't teach men. Really? What about this? How do, you, how do you discount what you actually see happening at this time? Do you toss this away because of how you might interpret a few words in a, in a letter from Paul? We'll talk about those at the end of this series in the course of this, but look at what Paul does. Look at how these women are part of this ministry. Is there anything to suggest that Priscilla is some sort of second class, as these stuff that she can't do. No, if that were true, her name would be left out. It would be focused entirely upon Aquila. But not only is she named, but she, her name comes first. More than it comes second, it comes first. So, wow, wow. And here is the greeting um, that Paul is, makes part of the Roman letter to the Romans. So the first person that Paul commends in Romans 16, which is a chapter most people just skip. Or if they're going to read the Bible in a year, that's a little chapter that they read in 15 seconds because it's just this long list of almost 30 names, most of which we can't pronounce. So he's, so the first verses, notice this is three to five, look at the top. One and two are about Phoebe. Here's three and five. Greet Priscilla. Oh, she's first again. And it's even her diminutive name. He knows her so well, Paul does, that he'll call her Scotty. You can call me Scotty anytime you want. My, my, I've told people here at the church, with Scott Anderson coming on, it's perfectly fine with me. Um, if you need to do that to keep us straight. He's much more dignified than I am. <laughs> I don't know if Scott's here or not, but yeah, it's true. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. Those are not idle words. Co-workers is significant every time Paul uses the words. They are significant. His co-workers in Christ Jesus, they are with him in this. Not just Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila. Co they risk their lives for me. What does that mean? Well, we know that when Paul got to Ephesus with them, that there was a lot of persecution awaiting Paul. Seemingly, they got caught up in all of that, as you would guess they would. You can, you can read the story in Acts 19. There's a whole big hullabaloo um, because the people, the people in Ephesus who made um, trinkets to sell little statues of the temple of Artemis in Ephesus. Kind of like, you ever been to New York and you came home with one of those little Statue of Liberty? <laughs> I, I did that when I was a kid. Went to New York and came home with a little Statue of Liberty. Had it for years. Don't know where it is now. Anyway, doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so they were selling these, these pagan, you know, little... And, of course, Paul comes into town and he says, ah, you know... <laughs> There's only one God, and that's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so um, they risked their lives. Surely Paul means they were caught up in the persecution along with Paul, binding them even closer to him. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them, which is why I said at the beginning, they are the most significant couple, married couple, that you encounter in the New Testament. They are busy, busy, busy. And Paul trusts them. Paul trusts them. What did they do when they got to Ephesus? What do you think they did? They set up a house church. They found a place to live. They found a house. They saw how, set up a house church and started meeting in their home. And now they're in where? 
Rome. Greet also the church that meets at their house. So Paul, is, they're now in Rome. Paul is writing to Rome. He knows some of the people there, like Priscilla and her husband, and now he's writing to them. They're meeting in their house again. Does, does, does it sound like she's some kind of second-class participant, co-worker? Didn't sound that way with Phoebe. Doesn't sound that way with Priscilla. Okay, so. Any quick question before I go on? Well, I, I think that <coughs> he isn't necessarily alluding in that sentence to all the churches, the Gentiles, being caught up in what happened in Ephesus because Priscilla and Aquila have been in Corinth, Ephesus, they're now in Rome, which are all three are very significant places in the Roman Empire. What he's referring to is the fact that they have been instrumental in Paul's work of carrying the good news of Jesus Christ to the Gentile world. And all the churches of the Gentiles, you're going to say all? It may be slightly hyperbolic, but it makes Paul's point. He and the other Christians are deeply grateful for the work that Priscilla and Aquila have done and are doing on behalf of our Lord. Yes. This would be the house churches. Everybody's meeting in house churches. Well, I mean, it refers to the people that meet at the house, but it is referring to when he, you, you, I, if you added the word, it would be all the house churches. In other words, all these little communities of Christians, right? So, um, but the focus, we are right, is not on the brick and mortar. It is on the people, but, but the organizing structure for uh, our organizing structure is not house churches, right? We all come together to this campus. But in their world, everybody's meeting in somebody's home. And the householder, the husband, and the wife of that household, of that home, are very significant in the structure because it's their home. They're the hosts, right? Kind of like hosting a small group, I guess, maybe at the church. Okay. Yes. Did they lose, uh, the Jews lose their Roman privileges when they were doing that? Did the Jews lose their Roman privileges? Once a Roman citizen, always a Roman citizen, but... I mean, yeah, I mean, the sense that they had to leave out their homes and livelihoods and, <coughs> and go, yeah. Claudius, Claudius kicked them out in 49. In 54, he died. And the way it worked was when the emperor died, those kind of edicts died with him. So they begin returning, and that is why Priscilla and Aquila can be back in Rome when the letter to the Romans is written. Uh, what? No, well, Paul didn't get kicked out of Rome, but Paul's citizenship ends up playing a big, a big part in the latter part of, of his life, particularly in, you know, as portrayed in the book of Acts. Okay, so I want you to meet one more person for sure. Now, this is, this is big, and this poor woman has gotten, ugh, it's terrible. So this is Junia. This is an, you know, a piece of iconography about Junia. Here's Romans 16, 7. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. These are Jewish Christians. Okay, Paul is a Jewish Christian. Most of them are Jewish Christians at this point. The movement is largely still in the mid-50s a Jewish movement. That's changing rapidly because most of the people in the empire are Gentile, but still. So Andronicus and Junia are Paul's fellow Christians, Jewish Christians. Um, they are outstanding 
among the apostles, among the wording all here matters and has been subject of great debate. They are outstanding among the apostles. Now, if we were sitting here 100 years ago, here's how this slide would read. Greet Andronicus and Junius. Because Andronicus is a male name, Junius is a male name, and we would assume they're brothers. Okay? Probably not father, son, probably brothers. My fellow Jews have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. But that was a darn shame because that is not what the Greek has in it. The Greek has the feminine form of the name, not Junius, it is Junia. That is settled at this point. There isn't really anybody who even disputes it anymore. It was changed from Junia to Junius somewhere along the way in the early church to do what? To protect the patriarchy because only men could ever be thought of as apostles. Not women, right? The patriarchy reasserted itself as the church began to grow. And poor Junia becomes a guy. And not in today's sense of that happening. This is not some kind of weird transgender thing. <laughs> Her name ends up being changed to Junia to Junius. And so now... We have to debate, well, what do the words mean? Outstanding among the apostles. Is the Greek really saying that they were among the apostles? And the answer to that is yes. And if you want to pursue this, I can give you um, some scholarly books that have been written about this which have really largely settled. And that's why even in the conservative NIV, conservative sort of theologically used by conservative churches like, you know, First Dallas and Prestonwood and stuff. It's written as it is. She's outstanding among the apostles. Prominent is another way it's sometimes translated, among the apostles. And notice the last bit. They were in Christ before I was. They've been at this longer than Paul's been. Paul has comes to Jesus about three years after Jesus' death and resurrection, when Paul meets him on the road to Damascus. But Andronicus, and this is almost surely a, a couple, Andronicus and Junia, have been about this for longer than Paul. Now, you have to embrace the larger understanding of what, of what an apostle is, right? Because there are the 12 apostles, capital A. But that's, the word is not that restrictive. The word means one who was sent forth to do what? To proclaim the word. That's their job. That's their focus. To go tell people about Jesus Christ. Paul could have written this only about Andronicus, but he includes Junia. Because they were co-workers of his. Junia, the apostle. Just think about it. You know, it's rightly said that Mary Magdalene was the first apostle. In the Gospel of John, she is in the garden outside, you know, this green area, outside the tomb, and she meets Jesus. And what does Jesus tell her to do? Go tell. Go tell. That's, that's the essence of the job of, of an apostle. Go and tell. And so she runs and she tells. It's entrusted to whom? A woman. So you, you have to keep all of this in mind when you, when you come to your New Testament. Here's an attestation. John Christendom was a Christian. Notice he's writing about 300-odd extra years after Jesus' death and resurrection. 350, let's call it that. So he's, he writes about some of these New Testament people, about the view of the early church and himself. And he says about Junia, it was the greatest of honors to be counted a fellow prisoner of Paul's because Andronicus and Junia are. Think what great praise it was to be considered of note among the apostles because Paul does that for Andronicus and Junia. 
These two were of note because of their works and achievements. Think how great the devotion of this woman, Junia, must have been, that she should be worthy to be called an apostle. But even here, Paul does not stop his praise, for they were Christians before he was. There's nothing magic about what John is writing. He's just reading and understanding the implications of it in his time, right? So, yes. Andronicus and Junia? Yes. So Joe's pointing out that it's certainly possible that Paul knew them before, before the road to Damascus, not the later, because notice what he says, before I was in Christ. If you ask Paul, when were you in Christ, he would say after I met him on the road to Damascus, not the, not the later when he actually begins the missionary journey. That road to Damascus event is the big thing, and so did he know them? Were, oh gosh, you could spin a novel out of this. Were they among the Jewish Christians that Paul was seeking to persecute in Acts? I mean, it doesn't say that, but could they have been? But what to, to write down in this letter Romans, two decades after the fact, they were in Christ before I was. Paul is, Paul is lifting them up, right? He's honoring them with this, because he is Paul, who even by 55 or 56, when he writes Romans, his letters are circulating. He is Paul. He is Paul the Apostle. So, yeah, anyway. So, you know, uh, just every once in a while, pick up Romans 16 and read, read through the names. Um, I brought a piece of paper, which I should have gotten out. So just talk amongst yourselves for a moment. It's right here. It's easily accessible. I actually made it easy on myself this time, except I didn't remember, but there we go. So I'm just, just going to read down. I, if I put this on the screen, you couldn't read it. So but I'm just going to read down this list of people, of women, in Romans 16. So, I've talked to you about Phoebe. I've talked to you about Prisca. Then there's Mary, Paul writes, who has worked very hard among you. So she's in Rome. Greet Andronicus and Junia. We just talked about Junia, okay? Um, we meet two, seemingly two sisters, um, Tryphena and Tryphosa, maybe tri probably Tryphena and Tryphosa. We meet Rufus and his mother. We don't get her name, but she's just referred to as his mother. But if you know me, that's significant enough, his mother. Um, we, there are, he makes a reference to sisters, um, um, of some of others who are here. And then he talks about a Julia and Nereus and his sister. So all in all, there are at least 10 out of the 26 that he lists here who are women, which just illustrates, I think, the extent to which women were an integral part of Paul's ministry. Okay? So... Long device. Let's talk about one more. This is Lydia. Okay? Lydia is a woman from who lives in Thyatira, and she is 
actually, he, she meets Paul in Philippi, the place to which Paul writes the letter to the Philippians, okay? And here's the story in, um, not the story, but here's, uh, <coughs> let me back up. So if, let me go to, to Acts 16. He says, on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. This is about Paul. Actually, this is where Paul, Luke is referring to himself at the same time because he doesn't do that through all of the book of Acts, but he's doing it now, so undoubtedly he is with Paul at this time. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. Now, what does that mean? It means that Lydia's, Lydia's got money, Cause, right? Because purple was a rare dye. Purple was an expensive dye. So by saying that she's a dealer in purple cloth, you, she, you are being informed that she is a woman of means. And her name is Lydia. She was a worshiper of God, probably meaning that she was a God-fearer, a Gentile, who is drawn to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and drawn to the river that day to pray. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household was baptized, she invited us to her home. Quote, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, close quote, she said, Come and stay at my house. And so she persuaded us to stay at her house. Because you know what? I bet she had a nice house. <laughs> <laughs> right? A nice house. Plenty of space, nice quarters, a good place to be. So this is Lydia. So she is in that area. And this next slide, it, God, he's too many devices. <laughs> Okay, these, this is at the end of the letter to the Philippians. These are two more women, Euodia and Syntyche. Those are female names, feminine names. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord, yes, and ask you, my true companion, who is um, probably a man named Epi Epaphroditus in Philippi, Help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause for the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers. There's that word again. So here's more co-workers. This is not just a male enterprise. It is, I'll close with this thought, and then I'll take questions for a couple, if we have a couple of minutes. Paul understands the theology here. He, he comes to understand that in Christ we are all one. Neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, Galatians. And he lives that out. He lives that out. And he wants to put everybody to work with their gifts in the work of the gospel not saying that there are silos. Well, this is what men do. This is what women do. This is what slaves do. This is what freed people do. This is what the Jewish Christians can do. This is what the Gentile Christians can do. No. Paul is all the time bringing people together, pointing out their unity, and putting them to work. That's what, that's what you find in Acts. That's what you find in Paul's letters. So when we come back next week, we're going to meet a few more women, and then we're going to talk about some of these troublesome passages in Paul that would lead some of Lauren Gerlach's peers, friends, young women of her age, to say to her, you should not be doing what you're doing at St. Andrews. In the year, oh, yes. In the year 2023, 
all coming from churches in our area, big churches in our area. So I, I just, oh, I, I feel like, I just felt like going into this year, it was just something that I wanted to talk about, but have the orientation of beginning by meeting the women before you get to a few words here and there in Paul's letters that we will we'll sort out, okay, what Paul likely means. So with that, any final thoughts and questions? Did you, we have anything online today, baby? No Pat Wagen, they, that was unprofessional. <laughs> Patricia, did we have anything <laughs> online? You could call me Patty. I can call you Patty, yes. thank you. One or two more questions out here, and then I'll turn it over to Patty. Yes. Well, let's think about how humans are. Do traditions arise about them? Yes. How reliable are those traditions? Impossible to assess. So I think the way to do it, Joan, is simply to deal with what you find in Scripture and what you can reasonably deduce from the context of, this, of the verse, what you can deduce from the time. So when Lydia, for example, were told, okay, she's a daily on purple cloth, it's only a tiny move to realize that she is a woman of means and will be a benefactor of Paul, right? Something else, anything Okay, Patty, it's all yours. All righty. So when you were telling everybody that they could now call you Scotty, the people who know you really well, can they call you Scotty boy? <laughs> I, I, will sure, I will sure answer that. Scotty boy works too. It's all good. <laughs> Scotty Olio, Scotty boy, <laughs> Scotty anything. Yeah, Scott is quite call, often called Scotty boy in our family. I'm not <laughs> sure why, but he is. Because I'm deeply respected. And <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we have prayers today for our classmate, Ben King. He's having tests tomorrow. It's a uh, nuclear test that he's having done tomorrow. And we are really praying for a good result for him um, regarding his cancer. Prayers for Gayla and John Hickman. Gayla is in rehab uh, after having a fall. And John is not mobile. And we have not seen them for a long time. Um, we need to keep them in our prayers. A prayer from Carol, prayers for her neighbor whose father passed away last night after being in the hospital with COVID and the flu. Uh, Katie Vitito, uh, hospitalized with a punctured lung. Please pray for a speedy recovery. Um, this one is uh, anonymous, but please pray for me as I undertake a new teaching position until the end of the school year. There is a joy, successful shoulder surgery. This uh, came from Melinda Dodd, and we're so happy to hear that. Uh, thank you for your prayers and my awesome nurse, which I'm thinking she means Troy, but I hope. <laughs> All righty. And... Um, in the hall, we talked to one of the ushers this morning, and uh, Jeannie Montgom Montgomery um, is going to be having um, major heart surgery on Friday. So let's keep her in our prayers. Um, online, Norm also put that um, he and Joan are actually in Delaware this morning, but watching online and saying that his grandson is doing very, very well. And this truly is an answer to prayer. This, this young boy was so incredibly sick. I, I fear a lot of people, you know, were really worried about him making it through this. So, um, and last of all, just another prayer again for our daughter-in-law, Courtney. She came, made it to church today. It's really a big effort for her, but she was really in a lot of pain and discomfort this morning. So we just, just pray that somehow the doctors can control, you know, her pain and that she's still able, able to be up and mobile though, of course. So um, if you would just go to God in prayer with me. Heavenly Father, we lift up so many joys, so many more concerns actually today, God, than joys, but we do want to lift up our joys to you. We, we do thank you for this day, God, that you've given us. We 
do thank you for the cool weather and it not raining when we walked in here this morning. We are very, very grateful, God, and we need to always stop and remember to thank you even for the, the little things. Uh, I know, God, that with a group this big and those online, not every prayer that is on our hearts were actually written down. And we just pray, God, that your Holy Spirit is able to pass on those prayers for us, to be able to pass on and articulate what the deepest prayers of our hearts are, God. We continue to pray, God, for those that we love dearly that have not come to faith yet in Jesus Christ. And we pray, God, that that would happen. And we pray, God, that seeds are being planted and that this possibly could be that year. And we're going to keep praying, God, until it happens. We pray, God, that you would watch over this group and keep us healthy, keep us safe, God. We pray all the time, God, every week for your wisdom and your discernment, God, to help us make good, de good decisions and good choices of the, of the things that come to our attention. Lord, hold us all close. Bring us safely back together next Wednesday. Next, sorry. <laughs> My birthday's Wednesday, God, and I think I got that on my mind. <laughs> but bring us back, actually, tomorrow online, Tuesday in person, and next Sunday here in class, Lord. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.